Good evening, everybody. And I hope you've all had a wonderful day at the summit thus far. And thank you for joining me today to speak about the South African games development industry and our history and where we've been and hopefully where we're going. Uh, so start off with, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nicholas Hall and I am a recovering lawyer. I have had the great privilege of being legal counsel for the majority of game development firms in South Africa. I currently hold a position as the CFO of Renderhead South Africa, one of the larger game development studios in the country based in Cape Town. Uh, and I also hold the position of CEO of Interactive Entertainment South Africa, which is our local games body. Uh, and we have general responsibilities to liaise with government, uh, help develop policy, and basically be a mouthpiece and a representation for the local games industry. So to start with, um, I thought I'd give a, a very high level view of what the South African games industry actually looks like. So in a nutshell, we are thoroughly indie. And what I mean by this is, is that for the most part, we're made up of very small studios. Um, most of them would be between one to five people. Um, we predominantly operate in uh, sort of alternative games or making small typed uh, games that are different or alternative. But we do also have quite a large services sector. So we have uh, a number of studios doing outsourced development and art services for a variety of uh, studios internationally, both for AAA and for indie. And in fact, the, the indie services sector where we provide both development and art services for international indie studios is definitely on the rise. Uh, surprisingly for Africa, and we'll kind of get into this a little bit later, but the majority of our development happens for PC and console, not mobile is what people would expect. Uh, and despite our small size, we've already had a number of successful titles that have been released into the international market. I've highlighted some of them on the right, as you can see, uh, sort of probably the biggest title to come out of South Africa was a game called Broforce made by a company called Free Lives based in Cape Town. That has the honor of being, I think, the best selling African IP in video games in history. Um, we also had Desktop Dungeons, which was a, a sort of an older title, but that has the acclaim of winning the uh, IGF award for design. Uh, and it actually beat out Minecraft in the year that it was developed. Uh, Vasira Cleanup Detail was also a, also a slightly older title from the early 2000s, it also found massive success. And most recently, Gorn, again by Free Life, the makers of Broforce, has been a smash hit on VR. Uh, we also have a number of, like I said, we, we try to play in sort of the uh, art or alternative game space. And we have a number of developers uh, who are making a name for themselves, working in creating alternative games that deal with different narratives or have different controller inputs. And they have been touring through various uh, festivals and shows internationally. If we look at it in a bit more detail though, if we kind of go into the numbers of what the South African game studio actually, or games development scene actually looks like, we have about 60 odd studios operating in the country. The major hubs are in Cape Town and Johannesburg with over 50% of both the workforce and studios being located in Cape Town specifically, but Johannesburg is not far behind with about 42%. Overall, there's about 457 jobs directly into the, in, in the games industry. So we employ a roughly 457 people full time. Uh, Unity is the engine of choice. And there are a number of reasons for that, which again, we'll kind of deal to when we start talking about uh, sort of the challenges that we're facing in the industry and how Unity has played a role in that. And if you were to look at the overall market share, uh, if you can value, if you were to make evaluation of both what the uh, consumers are spending in the country along with what the developers are making. In 2021, it's expected to reach around 333 million US dollars. Uh, and that's growing at about 10% year on year. So by all accounts, we're tiny. Uh, I mean, none of these numbers are huge, especially if you con con um, compare them to, you know, international, uh, jurisdictions that have really founded and established game development scenes like Canada or France, or the United Kingdom or the United States. But we are growing. 
we have had a, a, a large degree of commercial success and we are probably the most developed game de uh, games ecosystem on the continent. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And I kind of want to start exploring that and what that means and how we're hoping to leverage this going forward. So first of all, let's talk about the opportunities that South Africa presents and why games development has managed to find the success here compared to say other African jurisdictions. Um, but also what we're hoping to leverage going forward. So one of our biggest competitive advantages is that, especially compared to the West, uh, we have a relatively low cost of living, which means that our production is a lot cheaper. In theory, we can produce games at a significantly le uh, lower cost than other jurisdictions, even if you were to factor in things like tax rebates that you can get in a lot of the larger established uh, studios. By some accounts, peop, uh, we, I've heard values say that we're somewhere between um, four to 10 times cheaper if you were to, you know, for, for labor costs compared to established jurisdictions. And labor being the largest cost for most game development, that's not insignificant. Uh, we also, one of the things that distinguishes South Africa specifically from the rest of the continent, and I think it's one of the critical reasons why we've had so much success, is that we have very strong tangential industries. Uh, and what I mean by this is the key ones for us are animation, film, VFX, and our software development industries are very large. We have uh, both an Amazon uh, and Microsoft sort of have presence here, um, which means we potentially have a very large and talented skill pool to draw from. Uh, and often it is the training facilities and these people that are in these tangential industries that have been coming into the game sector and making their mark. And it's specifically why our services sector is so long. We may not be, oh, not so strong rather. It may not be that we are necessarily the cheapest. There are certainly other countries out there offering uh, services, outsource services that are cheaper than us. But I think one of the big things that we can offer is value for money. We may not be the cheapest, but we can certainly offer first world sort of quality in terms of both engineering, graphic design, animation. Uh, one of the big things for Europe specifically that we've managed to leverage to our advantage is that we're obviously on the same time zone or close enough for most of Europe that doing business with South Africa is fairly easy. Uh, and that makes it a strong potential for our services sector. Most of the people working in services have leveraged that, that to their advantage by working in the majority of their customers being in Europe. And, and a big thing that we haven't, this is really a, a true opportunity that hasn't really been exploited yet. And I, I think it will be critical to our growth, but we have the opportunity to create unique stories and narratives that are largely missing from uh, the global perspective. Um, I think with, uh, for example, I think Black Panther really gave a, a window into what could be told about Africa. If you look, generally speaking, in video games specifically, um, and how Africa is portrayed, it, it's not good, right? Uh, either it's, it's, it's seen as sort of this war zone, um, where some hero from the West needs to come and save the local population. Um, it's often treated and sort of highlighted before the poverty and the troubles that are shown there, but very little is spoken about the value that could be added to it or, you know, all the good things that are happening in the continent. Um, we're predominantly available in, uh, in sort of in sports scenes, but then in sports games, so like the cricket, rugby or, or FIFA say, uh, but again, we're a background then. There's nothing really in, engaging with what the continent has to offer. And I don't think there has been a major AAA title or major game that features an African protagonist. Um, although hopefully these things will start changing. Uh, but linking back to Black Panther and the success that that found, I think that there is a demand for this. And we certainly see it in other, in, in, in other industries such as film, for example, and animation, where there's this demand to get this unique content that only we can offer. And that's certainly something we're hoping to exploit. Uh, but it's not all um, roses. There are a number of difficulties that we face both on the continent and specifically in South Africa. One of the biggest issues is that there's no sources of domestic funding. Uh, so there's no grants, there's no government support, there's no tax rebates. And up until recently, there hasn't even been a publisher uh, on the continent. 
And that means that to date, nearly all games in South Africa have been self-funded, which means that the studios themselves have to take on the cost of doing basically their entire production. That's recently changed. There's been a number of studios, Freelives being an example, who have managed to leverage their early success into getting deals, sustainable deals with other publishers, and that's sort of starting to change. But it is, generally speaking, narrowed to very few studios. Luckily, the global games industry has become cognizant of this uh, issue. And obviously, it's not something just that faced South Africa, but the global South uh, in its whole. And there's been a number of initiatives in place that are hoping to stimulate and make accessible funding for uh, non-Western developers, which we've managed to capitalize on. Uh, but even that being said, often these are only done much later in the production cycle. You know, you still need to be able to present your vertical slice or your or your very first demo, or playable demo, and there's no opportunity as there exists in other countries to kind of get that at least partially subsidized or even wholly funded. And that's been one of the major stopping blocks of getting more people into the industry or seeing our studios grow and scale is is that they can just never receive the financial opportunity to do that. Closely linked to this is, is that access to international into the international ecosystem is generally challenging. Um, visas from Africa to Europe or to the West has in generally incredibly difficult. It is very expensive and there's no guarantee that you'd even be able to attend it. And if you think about where the major trade shows are happening, GDC, for example, or Gamescom in Germany, um, it's critical that you're there at these events because that's where you meet people. That's where you can negotiate deals. And historically, those have been closed off to a lot of African and South African developers. And so getting into the ecosystems, being able to meet the publishers, being able to meet the investors who would be prepared to invest in your game or your game studio has historically been difficult. Luckily, uh, or I suppose this is an odd way of saying it, but COVID has changed that. The global pandemic has meant that a lot of these um, events have gone online, which have made them far more accessible to our local developers. But also it has, increased to, uh, or rather it has increased the likelihood of international studios hiring foreign talent and not requiring them to, to move, to emigrate. And something that we've seen specifically in this, in, in 2000, uh, 2020, was the rise of, the, of a number of developers working for international studios as employees, even though they're still based in South Africa, which has been fantastic. Another big thing that we've seen is, is that we don't have anchor studios. And what I mean is that this is a large studio that can sort of absorb the workforce generally and gives a way for new entrants into the market to, or new entrants into the industry at least, to have a secure job where they can learn the ropes. It's very much in South Africa that if you, and this is true for Africa as well, that if you want to get into the games industry, you basically have to start your own studio. And that is obviously wrought with danger and leads to a massive failure rate. Uh, these two things linked together mean that scaling is difficult, uh, which takes me on to my next challenge point is that we have a high attrition rate. Often what will happen is people will come, they decide to start their own studio, and then they'll never get the funding or they'll release and they don't have, uh, you know, they, they aren't successful commercially and so they leave. Um, or people will stick around for a few years, but then will either decide to pursue uh, better opportunities in other industries, or what started to happen again is, is that they'll find some degree of success and then they'll leave the country. And this means that we have a skill shortage in the soft skills that are required, like production and general management for bigger level games. Uh, but also we sort of have a, a, a five year skills gap is, is that we've got lots of people who are newly entering into the market because we have a well established education system, um, feeding in new recruits and new graduates. Um, and we have a couple of sort of high level people who've been around for more than 10 years to kind of, and who've managed to establish themselves. Um, but that mid-level is almost completely lacking. And that means scaling up to do larger projects is in incredibly difficult. Uh, so what are we, what are we hoping to, to improve? Um, one of the things that we're doing at the moment, and you'll notice this is not true, not just true of South Africa, but of Africa as general, is, is that there's very little concrete data around what the games development industry actually looks like. 
Uh, as AISA and through AISA, we've been conducting industry surveys for a number of years to try and get a better understanding of what's going on. And this year, we're doing a larger study where, and we've managed to attract a number of other strategic partners to assist us in this, in developing a comprehensive study on what is exactly going on in the industry. And we're hoping to, and well, the core outcome of this research is really to help us develop a strategy for the sector. Uh, one of the things that we've kind of early on identified, and it's something that we've been trying to build for, is that we want to see anchor studios. This is larger studios of employing between 30 to 50 people start emerging from our ecosystems, either naturally in terms of the, our existing studios and manage to scale up their productions and scale up their workforce, or we see international studios wanting to come in and perhaps setting up satellite offices or um, uh, partnering with local studios and this is i think something that i'm particularly interested in is is that the opportunity for co-production uh, i think is great and i'm hoping to see a lot more um dialogue and partnerships forming between south african studios and european studios specifically we've already had a large degree of success with this uh, with nordic uh, companies specifically who have taken uh, an interest in the South African game development scene and attended a lot of our local events, but also through Unity, who has made a, a protracted effort to get to the country and the continent at large and really push their project, uh, their product. And because of that, um, Unreal, for example, doesn't really even have a strategy for Africa as a whole. Um, and so the market has you know, they've mostly neglected the market, but Unity has very much been on the ground. They've been doing a lot of work here. And through them, we've been able to connect to the Nordic states. Um, I'm hoping to see, and I know that there are plans afoot for us to see similar initiatives with other European countries. I know that the, the French, for example, France has been doing a lot of work in developing both the animation sector, and now they're starting to take an interest in what's going on in the games development scene. And so this should hopefully lead to a lot more partnerships, uh, which can be exploited. Uh, and uh, similarly with Germany, um, we're hoping to see, again, a similar sort of relationship. They're starting to take an interest in what is going on. And this will hopefully fill in a lot of the gaps that we're seeing, because I think once we've got larger studios from international shores working with our local studios and kind of giving them the stability, but also the experience, of working on larger titles or working with very experienced developers will give a bit of stability that we need uh, and will allow these local studios to grow because without them we're not going to be able to achieve the critical mass to get mass sustainability within the industry itself which is currently the, our biggest risk um, if you were to ask me if something like freelance for example is closes down or decides that they want to move offshore that would basically kill our local economy. So we don't, we, we need more studios actively in development, both in the services and in own IP production uh, to really solidify our local industry and allow it to grow. The goal that we had was to get 20 studios employing 20 people by 2020. Um, and that was sort of my own goal that I was working for through AISA. And unfortunately, we weren't able to achieve that. Uh, but we sort of set our sights again, and we're not deterred. There's a lot more fundamentals in place that will allow us to achieve this goal, I think, by 2025, which is actively what we're working for. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, if you want to reach out to me, I would love to share more my knowledge with you. Uh, if you have any questions around specifics that I haven't been able to cover, um, please feel free to reach out to me. You can contact me on my email at nickhall at renderheads.com. I'm also on Twitter at nickhallsa or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's it for my talk. I hope you have a wonderful evening and have a wonderful summit.